Okay, Vipasha, we are live. Good evening, everyone. I hope all of you are safe and sound wherever you are. It is my pleasure to welcome you for our sixth conversation on TechRx, Accelerating MedTech Innovation, a monthly program brought to you, brought to you by Andhra Pradesh MedTech Zone and Inc. Since time immemorial, uh, immemorial, the convergence of science and technology has improved the quality of our lives. When science and society work hand in hand, progress is inevitable. And as Carl Sagan beautifully puts it, we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology, and yet have cleverly arranged things so that no one almost understands it. At TechRx, we exactly attempt to do that, rearrange and deconstruct the work of entrepreneurs and innovators by showcasing their journeys and the impact of their journeys. Uh, our topic of conversation today is healthcare access and innovation. I would like to in, uh, welcome Lakshmi Praturi, the CEO, founder and CEO of Inc. Uh, Inc. is a platform for innovation operating at an intersection of science, technology, community, and culture. And we work across communities, age groups, and disciplines to create conversations and instill an innovation mindset. Together with AMTC's primary vision of enabling startups through research and incubation facilities, we've collaborated together to bring you this series of conversation. We have a really special guest today, whose name is Terry Bressingham who's passionate about developing new systems of healthcare that yield more precision, affordability, and accessibility for patients. She's a proven innovator and global healthcare domain expert with a track record of technical, commercial, and operational excellence that creates sustainable, profitable growth across many situations and geographies. Before we can bring the both of them in, may I request our team to play the AMTZ video? Okay. 
Okay, is it okay now? Yeah. Okay, great. So sorry about that. Uh, uh, Terry, welcome. And uh, I just wanted to say that uh, um, for us at Ink and working together, this has been a dream uh, come true today because we just dream of it. Oh, this is the person you and if you figure out how to meet them and be read about you to work as the ex chief innovation officer of DC. When we are uh, when we wanted to get a hold of you, I connected with my friend Gopi Katragada, and he connected uh, you to us. So, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's your journey. The healthcare innovator that really has uh, invited you here. I'm gonna get off. Why don't you give a talk? I'll come back again to ask questions. Okay, I didn't quite catch what she said, but um, yeah, she she just log back right in, Terry. It might so you can okay. just give an introduction about your journey so you get to know you better. We have audiences at the auditorium as well as people logging in online. Um, just for everyone who's joined in right now, it's going to be a sixty-minute session. We'll have Terry give us a, uh, give a talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then Lakshmi and Terry will have a conversation with each other, and after which we'll open um, open up for audience questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Terry. Now the stage is all yours. Okay. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks for the invitation, and uh, first, congratulations on uh, promoting uh, healthcare as as a as a field, as well as the innovation that that uh, healthcare clearly could benefit from. So. For all of you that are listening in, and if your careers are associated or your academic work is associated with healthcare, uh, I you have my blessings. This is uh, one of the places that I have had a long-standing passion for, um, even as a teenager, and uh, I, I've never lost it. And I would say that when it comes to understanding the human body and and what we can do to make ourselves uh, proactively more healthy, as well as what to do when uh, a problem arises. Um, it is a fascinating uh, field that's never uh, never static, and uh, as we discover more, it's been something that uh, I'll have to say has been um, uh, really an exciting area. Even though I've been in this for such a long time, um, each day still feels like it has a freshness to it. So, uh, what I what I hope to do today is uh, is I'll give you a little bit about my background, but I'm really uh, interested in a dialogue with you and and how you see the future of healthcare or what problems have you faced as a innovator or entrepreneur in this area um, because it is in fact a, a very complex delivery system so we can talk a lot about that but just a bit of my background um, academically I, I got degrees in biomedical engineering and chemistry um, that uh, at first in the uh, in the academic centers and then went to a GE and GE Healthcare at the time um, was involved in diagnostic imaging and uh, in the course of the 30 years that I worked at uh, GE I held many positions first as an engineer design engineer uh, then as a project leader as an engineering project leader then I transitioned over to product management in the marketing group um, and I'll just pause there in a moment because what was uh, clear in that transition was the fact that as you think about your engineering problem, it really is in many levels a systems design problem. And when I shifted over into product management, you start to think about more of the business dynamics in that. And yet, um, in my engineering brain at least, those were also systems engineering problems where you had some transfer function of inputs to an output or outputs with control variables and things that you couldn't control. So that's kind of the way I've always thought about this. 
Uh, and then from that, I led uh, some of our global product businesses, um, which was also very fascinating, inclusive of all the things that we would do for um, service and data analytics. And then uh, came to India, and I worked in India for seven years, uh, first as the head of our India and South Asia uh, coordinated uh, countries, in, uh, responsible for all the aspects of the PNL, uh, commercial, financial, um, product development and service. And then I uh, expanded that. We expanded that to uh, sustainable healthcare solutions across the 70 emerging markets of healthcare. So Africa and Southeast Asia and, and India as well. And this was a fascinating um, and very important, I would say, part of my career because it really opened my eyes to what problem are we really trying to solve? Um, technology, of course, being at the heart and soul of many things that I think about, um, it's tempting to take technology and find that problem to solve. Um, but with this role, I really started to sit down with ministers of health and you know the large aid agencies and really try to understand how do we build sustainable frameworks for healthcare delivery? And yes, there's a component of that, which is technology, but the idea was to really think about how do you build systems of care and how do you do that with more affordability and more accessibility? So I really learned a lot from that. And um, and then from there, as, as uh, was mentioned, I became the chief innovation officer for GE Healthcare's business as we were preparing to spin out the healthcare business publicly. Um, and this was to create more sources or new sources of growth. So I investigated and uh, built businesses around 3D printing in healthcare, as well as uh, things like uh, artificial intelligence, um, augmented reality and, and virtual reality for the use in which uh, interventional procedures, for example, could be done. So that was a tremendous amount of um, fun, really, to to think through these ideas and how to build those from uh, ground up. So from that, uh, I left GE and uh, started my own uh, advisory service and uh, have been working with different companies around the world, most of them early stage companies, um, as boards of healthcare uh, delivery systems, as well as product development companies. And it's really a chance to take everything that I've accumulated over this period of time and think through what is the new uh, horizon of healthcare. And I'll t and we can get into more of this, but I think there's uh, this next decade may be in fact, one of the most transformational decades within the healthcare ecosystem. Uh, one, because we're much more um, delving deeper into the genomics and genetics and proteomics of disease and COVID vaccine is an example of that as an RNA based uh, vaccine, first of its type in the world. Um, we're using data unlike we've ever used uh, data and the exhaust of data off of healthcare uh, lends itself to being uh, mined and used in a way that will create better clinical decisions as well as operational decisions or efficiencies. And then the third element I think is, is underway and that's um, actually much more prevalent in India and that's the consumer driven model of the business side of healthcare. You know, in India, as an individual, you you go to whichever healthcare uh, person or center you want to, and you do that based on your own criteria. Um, many parts of the world, whether they're public systems or um, the private insurance companies in, in markets like the US or, or Europe, you're kind of dictated to where you'll go. And therefore, the patient doesn't understand the cost structures of healthcare. And I see that starting to change now. And then, of course, in the digitization and data process of COVID, we, we see this acceleration of virtual medicine. So I'll just say, I think it's an exciting area. I think there's lots of things we can talk about today. And I wanna thank again, the organizers of Inc. RX for inviting me. So back to you. Can you, can you hear me now and can you see me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay. You can only hear one of me instead of multiple of me like before. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Terry, thank you so much uh, for taking time. I was just saying earlier that, uh, you know, we get to dream up every month. Who do we want to talk to who really can um, give us some insights into the intersection of technology and health? 
uh, you know, so TechRx, that's what it stands for, is technology and health. And uh, when we find, oh, this is the person we want to meet, which we really wanted to meet you, then we start searching, how can we get to this person? And I was just acknowledging, uh, thanks to my friend Gopi Katragadda, who used to uh, be the chief at uh, GE India, we got through to you. And uh, thank you so much for that. So we have to always thank our friends for making the connections to uh, people we dream about uh, meeting. So thanks a lot. Um, you know, uh, I just wanted to touch upon a couple of things personally about you, uh, Terry, is uh, you've been at a, obviously one of the most influential companies uh, in the world uh, and, uh, and in a very, very senior position. So um, one of the things I wanted to understand is I always say working for a big company is like, working for a large economy, you know, because, you know, most of the companies are larger than many economies uh, in this world. So um, what is some of the huge responsibilities and the ability to make impact that comes with working for a large company? And maybe if you can give one or two examples of in your time, what is one of the things you saw? I mean, I always talk about, I worked at Intel for 12 years and I say watching Intel inside launch was one of the biggest learning moments for me. Uh, you know, a chip company becoming a consumer company was a huge thing I learned and the impact it has made. So like that, can you tell us a little bit about your time as working for like, it's like being a prime minister of a small country. <laughs> running a big division in GE. So tell us about the responsibilities and the advantages that come with running a large company. Well, Lakshmi, I'd say there's actually two ways to think about that in my mind. One is that with any job that you have in a, especially in a, a larger corporate structure, um, your responsibilities are somewhat the same in that you're responsible for delivering on the on your job's description. And um, that that matters a lot. And a second part of that, of course, is to be someone that others want to work with. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you interact with people? How do you communicate? How do you uphold your end of the bargain? Um, so it doesn't matter necessarily what level you're at. Uh, your your responsibility is to, to stand and deliver and to be constructive within a, a work environment is is um, is is clear. Yeah. I think uh, as you move up in responsibilities, and you know, at, at a point where I had uh, you know like all seventy countries that were reporting to me and and our our business to drive that uh, the growth in those markets and deliver on customers you know, uh, needs, I would say the, the largest, you know, stress, if you will, of your responsibility is two. One is, or do you have the right strategy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause there's yeah. no one else there to say, you know, I mean, you consult many different people, but at the end of the day, you're making the decision ultimately about what strategic investments are going to be made. How do you use your finite set of resources? for the greatest good. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, when think when you're in a smaller group, those decisions also feel, you know, heavy, but the consequences, if you're wrong, are very small, right. relatively. So at a bigger level, when you're, you know, allocating, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars to drive billions of dollars in revenue, and you want to make sure you've thought through all the different possibilities, I think that's one of the that you do spend a lot of time, you know, contemplating and hoping mm -hmm. at some level that you've actually made the right choices, but also to have systems in place to continuously go back and reassess, you know, your your decisions. I think one of the mistakes that a leader can make is once you've made these decisions and you, you know, you make a great case as to why those are the right decisions, at some point in the future, things may have changed. The the market may have changed or Customers' needs may have changed. The competition may have done something differently, and um, people don't. You know, they're not as. Um, you're. You're. It's easier usually to change a prior person's decision than it is to change your own decision, because you get wedded to that idea, and you've been. You know, you poured yourself into it. So I think that is one. And then, of course, the other big responsibility is customers and whether or not you're doing the right things for customers. 
you can do things in the short run to maximize your own business outcomes. But um, when you're leading, you know, or ultimately responsible for a big group of customers, I always would stop and think, what what is the best thing? What's in the best interest of my customers? You know, right. I can make a decision that might be more cost effective for me, but in the long run, is that the best decision for my customer and their, you know, their businesses? So I, I think that's a, a second one. And the third one, of course, and one that I could have actually started with, which is you're responsible for a lot of people. Right. You know, right. This yeah. is, are you creating a culture that they want to stay with? Are you creating an opportunity for them to grow? Are you making the uh, the proposition to them about why this strategy is the right strategy? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, these are, you know, if you do well, if the business does well, based on these things, then will thrive. And it's an exciting right. place to be in. If the business doesn't do so well, um, it can be a very tough place for people. And um, and even in the case, extreme cases of when you have to restructure and let people go. I mean, these are, at the end of the day, human beings with real lives and, and people they're responsible for. So I think right. that's the other uh, area that I've always tried to think through these three the strategy, the customers, yeah. and then the employees. You know, the reason I asked is specifically is that we are addressing AMTZ, uh, you know, our core host, which is the medical tech zone that they're developing. And when you have huge stakeholders like the government and the equipment makers and the customers, the stakes are incredibly high. You know, and sometimes you have to agree and commit or disagree and commit and move everybody along. It's not always following your heart or doing, uh, you know, what you want as opposed to what's right for the cause and what's right for the delivery of that. So there is that, you know, constant, of course you are there, but you know, how to pull in and out is very important. And I think AMTZ is on a huge mission to make yeah. India a place for medical, uh, you know, medical technology, especially. So I wanted that big company perspective. And then now you are actually on your own and you are in a medical advisory role and you see a lot of startups with a lot of ideas, etc. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what are some of the things you're looking at you're very excited about what are some disruptive ideas you're seeing that you're excited about oh my goodness this is uh this is why i'm so excited i think um i mean there is if you look globally there is a tremendous amount of money chasing healthcare ideas so uh the opportunity to you know advance healthcare being supported by you know the the venture capitals, angel investors, and and even some of the the bank you know banking industry is is quite exciting, and I think um, ultimately that will lead to to you know some substantial breakthroughs. I think the three areas that are really active, um, as I mentioned, I think this whole pursuit of genomics, genetics, proteomics, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, cell based therapies. Um, yeah. I think that is. You know, within there's a tectonic shift going on right now from our traditional way of treating disease, which is, you know, wait until the disease has happened, uh, you know, use invasive methods uh, or small chemical compounded drugs to treat those uh, conditions. Mm-hmm. And the future really is bringing in, ushering in this new level of precision, which is will know from the genetic signature of that particular manifestation of your risk for that disease early on. So we maybe have a shot at at catching it earlier Mm -hmm. Um, or even in the future, uh, changing that genetic code with technologies like CRISPR Mm -hmm. so that the person that was born with that genetic predisposition uh, can be cured, if you will. Right. Uh, And then, you know, cell-based therapies that are, you know, we can take cells now out of your body for certain types of blood cancers, for example, and train them to go back into your body to attack that cancer and some remarkable, you know, advancements in that. So I think that whole change over to biological therapies, but on the basis of understanding the the molecular or protein or or genetic basis of the disease is... um, 
I mean, every day is another article that's published about this. So that's uh, that's clearly one. And the whole biotech industry, of course, is is moving on. And I think for a footnote for India is, yeah. you know, how do you take what today India is the largest provider to the world for generic drugs, but these are small molecule chemically compounded drugs. Mm -hmm. So how does the investment, because it's a very different approach for these biologics, how's the investment in the platforms for that next generation of drugs, how does India hold its place in the world for becoming that uh, biologics producer? So I think that's that's an area that I think about and and hope that uh, my friends in India are you know able to yeah. to find a path there. Yeah. The second area of course for technology is based on data and digitization. Mm -hmm. There's tremendous opportunity um, the healthcare we say healthcare system it's really not a system. It's a yeah. set of kind of loosely stitched together cottage industries trying to operate like a system. And a lot of that is because the gaps in the information transmitting to the right person at the right time so that patient gets the right care at the right time. Um, so I think lots of uh, very interesting ideas, lots of new algorithms being developed. Um, and here again, there's some great groups in India that are producing uh, you know, global uh, products for uh, the use and you know, better detection of disease or earlier assessments of disease so I think that's a, there's clearly an opportunity. You know, ultimately, in not that short a time, all medicine is going to be augmented by computer support systems. Decisions that are being supported by, you know, algorithmic, uh, data-driven uh, algorithmic uh, support. And we shouldn't fear that. I think these can be done very carefully and safely, but I think they will lead to better consistency of care, better outcome of care and clearly right. uh, lower cost of care. And then the right. last area that I see a lot of investment in is just how healthcare is, where and when and by whom is healthcare being delivered by. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Vir virtual technologies, of course, just got a huge, you know, accelerant because of COVID. Yeah. And it applies not just for patients, but I think also for physicians. I mean, if you would have asked somebody pre-COVID as a physician, you know, how many you know telemedicine visits would you like to do today? They'd say, well, a none. You know, yeah. I want to see my patient. I want to talk to them. I want to be you know in person, eye to eye with them. Yeah. Um, I think at at this juncture, if you talk to that same population of physicians, they're saying, listen, for certain types of visits, yeah. this is a much more you know convenient for my patient. It's it's more okay. productive for myself, mm -hmm. and um, so I think that's another trend that clearly will uh, persist, if, if you will, after this pandemic. And also, continuing on to that, people are coming up with solutions. Like I was talking to someone and they said, you can cough into an app and by the way they can listen, they can tell if you have a certain disease or not. I mean, in the sense, there are very, very interesting things. I cannot yeah. imagine that, uh, you know, that you just you can predict you can and because the system has so much data in it that it is evaluating it um yeah, it's, and it's, I, uh, yeah. yeah. and we do, but we don't harvest that data as effectively as we should or could right. and that's where i think the digitization and the data analytics will be you know um the, and that's moving now much faster than it than it was there's a lot of other technologies lakshmi that um, are also really exciting um, but for example, one company I'm working with is is using bioelectric uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. You know, the electricity is the natural language of our body. Our cells mm -hmm. communicate with each other through hormones and electricity. Yeah. Um, they're harnessing this to actually re-communicate, if you will, to, um, for example, a person with stroke who ends up with a spasticity. And that's a very common uh, mm -hmm. spasticity approximately 40% of patients who have a stroke end up with a, a leg or an arm, which is, you know, uh, in constant uh, contraction. Right. So not only is that painful, but they lose the use of that arm. This company has devised a non-invasive way to tap into between the spinal column and the peripheral nervous system mm -hmm. to re-establish communication, to let that limb reopen. And it's... Wow. Um, allows for that person to regain the use of that limb, re relieves the, you know, the pain, of course. But uh, bioelectric medicine is, is uh, fairly new, um, but there's a lot of ways I see people looking at that for 
a variety of things. Um, uh, I think another, of course, interesting area is 3D printing. Right. And how do we yeah. have 3D printing in the world or augmented reality and virtual reality? I think those are also another very fascinating areas for healthcare. Yeah. Um, there's, um, you know, a miniaturization of, of, the, of devices. Mm -hmm. And I think what, again, what that is going to open the door for is you think about a miniaturized device coupled with um, computer aided decision making mm -hmm. or detection, as you said. Mm -hmm. um, we will, as our own patient of N of yeah. one, uh, be able to do a lot more for ourselves because yeah. the intelligence is going to be built in and the device will be miniaturized and cost effective enough so that I could have it at my home or have it in my village or I could have it, you know, in a small clinic. And I think um, that's another exciting area because I think globally, more than 5 billion people lack access to quality right. care. And that's, that's just a travesty. I mean, that's just, we know what to do. It shouldn't be yeah. only because you don't have the, the funding or the money that you don't get access to care. Um, so I think technologies which are, um, you know, being adapted, miniaturized, built-in intelligence so that we can extend the points of care around the world. I think that's another really exciting area. And I think there's, so, well, there's hundreds of new things that are happening, yeah. but uh, as I said in my <laughs> intro, that's why I encourage yeah. people to stay in healthcare because it's always a, it's a never ending and always changing uh, dynamic uh, technology base. Right, right. And also I, I wanted to point to something you said earlier that healthcare is not a system. It's like a loosely connected cottage industry so far. And I think yeah. because of technology, because we are actually harvesting the data, we can aid the doctors better in, uh, you know, in evaluating a situation or whatever. Um, and at the same time, I want you to talk a little bit about the potential follies of technology also. Like one of the things we've been talking a lot about, especially in AI, the, a lot of the data that's fed into it is male and white and certain geographies, et cetera. So a lot of the predictions that are coming out of it uh, or the direction it may show could be based on a skewed data. So there's a lot of work being done, especially in India right now, of mm -hmm. how to make the data more compatible. So how do we get data sets from women and uh, across diversity, et cetera. So tell us a little bit about what are the things we should watch out for and make sure that technology serves us better as opposed to biases us. Yeah, well, I think it's a great question, Lakshmi. I mean, if you think from the beginning of time in medical you know, technology yeah. development, it has yeah. always been biased. It's, uh, right. you know, cohorts are usually young, healthy, males and North American males or, you know, Caucasian males at that. So much of the research that's been done has always been, you know, uh, or had been based on that. Um, I mean, things are changing, but uh, you raise a great point with artificial intelligence or machine learning and deep learning as to what is the basis, basis of the data. Um, you know, the, the things that I think we're beginning to learn is how, you know, how do you build good robust data, curated data, um, and how do you make sure it represents the population that you're serving? And how do you manage to measure and monitor the biases that will ultimately, you know, get created? And, um, you know, if you look at what Cure AI has done in India, um, one of the reasons that they continually win these comparison, you know, of their algorithms and others' algorithms from other parts of the world, why did they win the highest, you know, sensitivity specificity? It's because of their database. They have the broadest, deepest, most representative uh, database. Uh, so I think there's a great example of, you know, why data matters and, and the right. quality and, and curation of the data matters. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say that that's clearly a, a place. One other area, though, that relates to just in general, that is um, how does technology go astray? Mm -hmm. It kind of relates back to something I said earlier, which is uh, people get very wedded to their ideas. Right. And right. instead of constantly looking at your idea with a fresh critical eye, mm -hmm. you know, when something when we start an innovation project, one of the first steps we start with is 
what problem are we really trying to solve and for whom mm -hmm. in the ecosystem of healthcare? Mm -hmm. And what comes before, what comes after, so that we can understand the system linkages within this. Um, and then after that, we'll sit down and try to, to you know, think through every single assumption we're making about this. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is it's not so much about can this technology work for this thing that we've decided. It's really about can that technology manifest itself in a system and be used in the actual workflow of the system to deliver the promise that, that we think it has. And I can tell you almost never have I ever had a project that we start with, we lay out all these assumptions, do they all hold true? Right. So you have to think through how you're going to test these assumptions, because if you're wrong about one of them, I mean, we're smart people, right? We come up with these great ideas. Right. Uh, but if we're wrong about one of these assumptions and we didn't test it and we're, you know, quite a ways down the path and we only then realize this underlying assumption was wrong, then, you know, you're left with a very difficult decision. Do you try to keep forging ahead, forcing it to work, or do you kill it and lose all right. this investment that you've just made? And um yeah, we tried yeah. to get much better at this. In fact, I used to do a quarterly award for, um, we called it the D.A.R.E. Award, with the tagline, which was, sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. Yeah. And it was to encourage yeah. people to, you know, if you've learned something that unfortunately makes your idea not work, you should stop. Right. And you, shouldn't, yeah. you shouldn't be afraid to stop, and nor should you be embarrassed to stop. Right. You should just say, hey, I learned something. And because of that, it it's going to compromise the solution. And I should, you know, I should think of something else. Right. No, I think that's a very, very good point. Because unless you keep doing things where you learn as well, and if you always go for the win always, you'll never learn. Uh, you know, and I think it's great that you you were positive about that as well, instead of saying, Oh my God, it's terrible kind of a thing. You know, one of the you know, things nobody wants to admit they've lost, right? I mean, in <laughs> sports and life, and you know, but in in technology development or innovation processes, yeah, you should really push yourself to say, you know, you know, are there things that I've assumed which, if they're wrong, could derail this, or have I learned something that now I know this is this is not going to be, you know, quite the right way to go about this. Um, yeah. stand up and say it and say, hey, here's what I learned. And because of that, we're sh we should pivot or we should kill this um, right. or we yeah. should. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, one of the things also I want to talk about, how can we make healthcare a more gender equal uh, industry? I, I think, um, you know, one of the things is healthcare is that it's a long term investment in healthcare, right? You don't just get up today and become like an expert. You either have to be an amazing researcher, uh, practitioner, you know, for to really like be able to contribute uh, at a certain level. So, what do you see in general uh, in healthcare? Uh, do you see gender equality? There's some work that needs to be done there. Uh, you yourself are a living example of. Um, you know, bringing that equality. So, well, well, I think um, as it relates to work I did in, and and our team did in India, mm -hmm. you know, we we started twenty five years ago, and and now a little more than twenty five years ago in India, and um, and we started with a very small group of engineers. Um, that team in Bangalore now is you know more than four thousand. Right. Um, in it's one of the best. actually. <laughs> it's one of the best innovation centers in our global network, uh, or it was in G's network. Yeah. Um, that being said, and of course, of uh, there's many. You know, the the capacity and capabilities of a center like that are unmatched, and and you know, we had a, a lot of success because we had you know all these experts and a and a great uh, system to support it. That being said, though, I I am also convinced you can have a very effective um, innovation, you know, uh, capacity with a small group of people, provided they are the right, you know, complementary skill sets, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're tied together on a, on a mission and they're frugal or resourceful on how they spend the the money, mm -hmm. um, because I, I I've seen wonderful examples of that both internally as well as externally. Um, and certainly there are things that lend themselves better to that, for example, you know, a software 
uh, or data algorithm that's that's a different you know cost structure to innovate than say a new medical device or a new drug. Mm -hmm. um, so I think what's important is to again really question what problem are you trying to solve and for whom? Mm -hmm. What are the underlying assumptions based on that? What mm -hmm. types of skills do I need to to bring that together? Some can be you know borrowed or or uh, you know temporarily purchased, others can be, you know, full time. Um, and then be very focused uh, about the point versus trying to do too many things at once at the beginning. Uh, you can think about, for example, a platform, but pick one specific application that you're going to drive it all the way through to. Mm -hmm. Because what you need is to be in the market and test this um, and and try to get there as, as quickly as possible. Um, the other thing I would say is there is tremendous um, clinician support in India. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you have to be careful a bit about when you should or shouldn't listen to a, a, a physician, an expert, yeah, yeah. if you will, in, right. the, in the care delivery, because you know, they have their own ideas. They also have their own biases. Um, but I would say we had a lot of the reason we had success from our innovation process in India was the fact that we were tapping into some of the best clinicians in the world, um, but who also had an eye for, you know, how cost effective does it need to be? How easy does it need to be to use? Um, right. Can it withstand some of the environmental assaults of, you know, fluctuating yeah. power yeah. and dust and humidity? You know, these are things that I think um, India as an innovation place for healthcare is in my book, one of the best. Yeah. It's and also, like you said, if you can solve it in India for all the conditions we have, it probably is useful, uh, you know, uh, transportable to other places. And, you know, my question was a little bit more about gender equality in uh, workplace also, because one of the, you know, the gender equality comes in two things. One is what you're talking about in terms of who we are serving uh, and who we are taking yeah. into our data. How do we make sure it's <laughs> gender sensitive and the other one is who are the people working on it and how do we make sure our work environment is more uh, yeah. gender equal so um, I mean like for example in a tech company I worked at Intel for many years it's very skewed right it's very very few uh, because the pipeline itself is small uh, right. but what are you finding in the healthcare industry are you finding it becoming better gender equal or what the company is doing? Is there anything innovative you can think of something that has been done that you thought was very interesting? Well, I think that um, diversity in a work team, yeah. the yeah. value it brings is the diversity of thinking and diversity of experiences. And I know that's been said many times, but I've lived it, I've seen it, it, it does matter. If you, if you gather together a bunch of people that you, know, you just happen to like or you know, you, they're more closely, you know, representative of who you are, right. um, you're not going to have that diversity of thinking and you may, therefore may miss out on something that could have happened. And um, so you, but you have to actively think about this and actually actively work to get that diversity. It doesn't happen naturally. And um, as you said, I mean, the pool of female engineers is smaller. I mean, that's reality. Right. Right. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that um, you wouldn't want to try hard to find those very talented, yeah. uh, right. you know, and or or people from other, you know, experiences to be part of your team because it'll fortify, it'll make it stronger. But I'll give you one very early example for me. So I was the only female in my engineering team. This yeah. was when I was working in CT, uh -huh. and we were designing an interventional CT system. Mm. And as the clinician, you know, you would have your hands on the patient but it would be therefore difficult to control the CT machine um, because, you know, your hands are busy. And so we're in this, you know, workout trying to brainstorm how are we going to make the control system work, you know, voice activated or, um, you know, have another person in the room who would control it and, and uh, such. And I said, well, why don't we put it on their wrist? Why don't we put a control panel on their wrist like uh -huh. you do when you sew? 
Right. Oh. And everyone in the room looked at me like, we've never sung. What are you talking about? You know? <laughs> and um, so it's a simple example, of course. Um, but we actually ended up designing this control panel that was attached to the physician's wrist so they could, while they're working on the patient, they could easily control the system. And it actually, it actually turned out to be my first U.S. patent was this okay. wrist wow. control. Now, would, would any of the male engineers come up with that? And I shouldn't be biased because some men also learn how to sew, of course. Right, yeah. um, but but, it's, I, but it's an example. It's an example how, yeah. you know, somebody from a different uh, experiential base mm -hmm. can look at a problem and think about it in a different way. Right, right. Um, yeah, great. I'd like to actually open up for questions from our audience. Uh, you know, Ritika, Rohan, if there are any questions, please ask or from AMTZ audience, if someone wants to ask, I uh, just want to open it up. Because we have another 12 minutes and I want to make sure. Actually, no. Yeah, 12 minutes. Any questions? Yeah, Lakshmi, we do have, I'm just uh, pasting it on the chat as well and I'll read it out for you, even Terry. Uh, okay. So this yeah, question comes from uh, YouTube, uh, the live audience. And it uh, asks it, what are some of the disruptive ideas you know India is coming up in its healthcare sector? And there's a follow up question to this as well, uh, which comes as uh, what medtech uh, innovation will be set in place to vaccinate India against COVID? Mm. Okay. Well, I'll start with the first one, which is, you know, what disruptive ideas are in India? You know, I think there's two really uh, big themes, if you will, that are happening in India. One is, of course, if you take what is necessary to care for patients, how do you reimagine those in ways that are much more um, able to be used in a distributed fashion and be able to uh, shift who is doing the work and where that work is getting done? So access uh, and, you know, I, I saw a lot of really cool ideas of people taking, you know, tablets, for example, and creating um, virtual physicians. Um, I think the the example of Tricog as, as another um, company in India, healthcare tech company, where they are uh, putting ECGs in every place, you know, small villages, small clinics. Um, the intelligence is built into the CCG uh, to identify the the heart risks of a person and diagnose them. And then this is backed up by a, you know, an expert system of clinicians, of, of cardiologists. You know, they have transformed the way someone comes in with chest pain. If there's not a cardiologist in the hospital, uh, you know, that person may not get the right decision and therefore not the right care and may not live simply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here's a company who's reimagined the way we should think about this, designed a whole other ecosystem to do this. And, you know, the numbers of patients that they've saved is, you know, approaching half, half a million. Yeah. And they're doing yeah. this at, you know, you know, a fraction of the cost. I mean, it's, it's under, you know, I think it's under 90 rupees. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, Okay, well, if I were to go into a healthcare system with chest pain here in the US, you know, it would be astronomically expensive. Um, and here's a way to do that and rethink that whole system. So it's it's data, data analytics, it's a uh, different um, form factor for the device, it's connected in the cloud. Um, and I think this is a way to, again, there's many examples of this, but I think these are things that in India, you can think through this idea, and uh, because there's a you know a billion people, what you can't make on a, a simple you know individual, you think about the volume of patients that are out there, and I think the business model can be adapted in that manner. Um, I think there's clearly, as I said earlier, the the work that's getting done with uh, biologics and genetics and genomics in India is also really exciting. I think there's. There's obviously work being done with, um, you know, algorithms. And uh, as I mentioned, Cure AI is one. Uh, Caring is another one that um, they're making headway. They're getting uh, FDA, you know, uh, clearance in their products and they're selling around the world. Yeah. yeah. When, it, when it comes to COVID and the vaccine very quickly, um, 
you know, there's more than 100 vaccines in clinical trial. Uh, India has, I think, three, in fact. Um, there's a rush, of course. This is There's probably a lot of really exciting things that have happened because of this. One is the fact the global, uh, you know, vaccine community has collaborated. Academics and companies have collaborated in a way that we've never seen before. Um, if you think about it, with the data analytics and the um, abilities to, I mean, it was January of this year that they had already fully sequenced COVID-19 and they shared that around the world. This is what China did. Um, I, you know, again, we've never seen that happen before. It would have taken months for that to happen. And, and with the data analytics capability, they were able to sequence that entire uh, genome sequence. And then from that, we've had, you know, um, we're using the you know RNA based and DNA based uh, vaccines never been used. I mean, we've been thinking about them and studying them, but we've never actually launched one. So we are taking a little bit of a risk, I would say, as to what the long term effect of that is. But um, you know, I think there's there's a lot of companies who are trying to think about the equitable dis distribution of these vaccines. Yeah. Uh, my brother works for Pfizer and I've talked to him and he's saying, listen, we are we have every country allocated, uh, you know, and we're trying to distribute this as fairly as possible. Um, this is not about making money. This is about making sure that the world, you know, can get a hold or get COVID under control. Yeah. That being yeah. said, the manufacturing. So one is to come up with a vaccine, the manufacturing capacity to produce the vaccine and the raw materials that it takes to produce a vaccine that is now the the new bottleneck if you will um in the in the system and you know those aren't things that you just kind of put up overnight you, you, a manufacturing facility for a vaccine is a you know is a very controlled uh, process requires specialized equipment and then the raw materials um you know things like um you know these these salts that are important in the in the uh, processing, and you can't you can't find enough of it right now. So I think if you were realistic, you'd say you know probably through the end of of twenty one and likely to the beginning of twenty twenty two before those that want a vaccine will have access to it globally. You know, uh, Terry, which are the countries you feel a lot of the manufacturing is happening right now of the vaccine? Um, well, I mean, India, India clearly is is a place. Uh, Serum Institute uh, is a place. Um, you've got places in Europe, especially in Switzerland, Germany, UK. Um, you've got places in, in Belgium. I should uh, mention. You've got obviously places in China. China has four um, emergency use authorized vaccines. Um, they're producing them in China for for China's population mostly, um, and then U.S. Of course, we've got you know. A number of places there, uh, and I'm sorry, in Japan and Korea also have uh, capacity. Um, okay. So, and I've probably forgotten a few others, but yeah, sure. um, but it, you know, as I said, it those are the existing places, and there has been, I mean, the amount of money, uh, you know, like Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccine, um, that which is in part or largely funded through the Gates Foundation. I mean, they they got eighteen billion dollars to help set up a distribution, and um, you know that's just the distribution of the drug uh, or the vaccine. So, um, I think Europe had put in another uh, ten billion dollars from a government standpoint. Uh, UK put in eight billion. I think in the US it's it's close to uh, twenty billion. So there the governments have stepped forward and they are trying. Um, it's just an astronomically large problem. We've never yeah. we've never done this before. We've never tried to inoculate the entire world uh, with the same yeah. vaccine, yeah, or yeah. similar vaccine. Okay, so we have very little time to wrap up. I just want to find out from the AMTZ auditorium if there's any question we can take it. Uh, else, we'll wrap it. Rohan, is there any anybody from the auditorium who wants to ask a question? Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for your time. Uh, I have few yeah, people yeah. who have questions for you. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll open it to them. Okay, we have time for one question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, good morning. Good so, morning. As we know that uh, for any product to succeed, uh, we need resources financially and by all means. So my question is, how would you as an innovator build a model to attract investors 
and you know plan on uh, keep building your models how would you do it well that's a, it's a super question it sits at the heart of almost every funding discussion uh, you know, I think a couple of things. One is to make sure you really have understood what problem you're trying to solve and, and how do you articulate that? It should not be about the technology. It should be about what problem are you trying to solve and for whom in this system of care? Is it for the patient? Is it for the nurse? Is it for the clinician? Um, really give some good thought to that because if you can articulate that clearly and crisply and why that's different, um, that can make a difference. The second, of course, is in the reality is, you know, how does this get monetized? Um, you know, is it something that displaces another technology? Does it, is it additional? Um, is it something that, you know, will, will create uh, an avoidance of cost? So think about the economics within the healthcare system as it lays out today and whether or not you think you can um, make an impact on that. And then the third, of course, is just the people on your team, you know, how passionate and committed they are. Uh, people like to fund people. Mm -hmm. So if they believe in the people and they believe in the idea, then you have a better chance. Yeah. So Terry, we are at the end Thank of the Thank you so much for this piece of knowledge. Let's okay. See. So I just want to ask you one last question and have you wrap up. Uh, by saying that, you know, healthcare is a huge, I mean, just the word itself is uh, all encompassing, uh, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think of healthcare, when you think of your journey, who, or maybe is there a story or is there a quote, is there a person, somebody that really, really inspired you, inspire, continue to inspire you in this uh, journey? Well, I think, yes, uh, many people, in fact, but I, I will start with, uh, my aunt, who I'm named after, uh, she was, she recently, she passed this year, in fact, uh, and unfortunately we couldn't be with her in person because of COVID, so it kind of breaks my heart, but I, I just always thought it was so cool that she was in a lab, you know, working in the hospital, uh, doing all these cool things, and knew, knew so much about the human body, and um, yeah. so she was my first inspiration, and then I would, would say Omar Ishrak, who was a person I worked for, for um, a long period of time and he taught me a lot of he's an engineer brilliant engineer but he's as equally brilliant as a business person and a strategist yeah. he just taught me a lot about how to think how to think about a problem how to think about a business model how to take risks um how to know when to advance something versus turn it off um he went on to become the ceo of medtronic he just recently retired from medtronic he's now the chair uh, of the board at intel so even though he's retired, he's, you know, he continues to make a huge impact on the world. And he, you know, he was from Bangladesh. And so when he would come to India or we'd go to Bangladesh, he never lost his desire to make a difference in the world. Mm -hmm. Somebody as accomplished and, you know, um, thoughtful as he was, he, he, he would always re remind all of us that we're, our job is not finished until everyone has equity in this world. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your time. And I really want to thank Dr. Jitendra Sharma, who's, uh, you know, been the brain behind AMTZ uh, and uh, uh, the whole team, you know, Rohan, Vipasha, Shishir, all of them who put this together. You know, as you can imagine, Terry, it takes a lot of people to make this happen. And uh, each month we do this with, uh, uh, you know, the idea is to take science to everybody in a in a fashion that they can understand so thank you so much for your time and uh, we look forward to being in touch with you hopefully once we start traveling you'll be back in india and uh, we can host you in uh, not just bangalore now in visakhapatnam as well and yes uh, where are you living now terry so i'm in boston um but for the period of of uh, time where we have a farm, a small farm in Tennessee. So we're we're uh, hanging out in in the farm during this COVID uh, process because we can work. We're fortunate we can work remotely. So yes, yeah. Well, listen, I, I want to thank you very much for this invitation and for the chance to have a conversation about something that I care deeply about. Um, as I said, I think you're all lucky if you get to work in healthcare because it's just a it's a it's a joy. It's a challenge. And it, it's so meaningful. Um, but I'll just leave you with a quote that I've had at my desk uh, since the time I was a college student. 
because I think it really aptly applies um, as you think about trying to do hard things uh, and healthcare is hard. And this is a quote by Theodore Roosevelt. One of the, he was the youngest president in the United States. His quote was far and away the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much and um, good luck on your work worth doing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.